Meet Jeanette McCurdy. She's an author, a writer, and a big feeler. So much so that she's making a podcast all about her feelings. Jeanette's memoir, I'm Glad My Mom Died, welcomed the world into the story of Jeanette and all of the intense life experiences that molded her into the person she is today. But how does she manage all of the messy, hard feelings she's feeling right now? In each episode of Hard Feelings, her new podcast with Lemonada Media, she'll tell you all about it. Jealousy, shame, social anxiety, she wants to laugh about it, cry about it, and work through it with you by her side. Why? These hard feelings are a big part of the human condition. They unite us all, but only once we're willing to face them. Hard Feelings is out now, wherever you get your podcasts. Can't get enough of your favorite Lemonada Media podcasts? By subscribing to Lemonada Premium today, you'll gain access to fun and inspiring bonus content from all of our podcasts across the Lemonada Media network. As a subscriber, you can listen to never-before-heard interview excerpts, behind-the-scenes segments, and continue to uncover new ways to make life suck less through all of our exclusive subscriber audio. Check out a free trial of Lemonada Premium today in the Apple Podcast app by clicking on our podcast logo and then the subscribe button. Lemonada. Okay, actually, can you just pretend that you're listening to a fully complete theme song here? I got really in my head, and I tried to make it perfect, and I couldn't. So this is going to be the theme song right here. (laughs) Hello, and welcome to another episode of Funny Because It's True. I'm Elise Myers. Today, I'm joined by actor, writer, and comedian Ron Funches. He's guest starred in a number of TV shows, performed on multiple late night shows, and he has his own podcast. We talked about the odd places one can find comedic inspiration and how it's good to be just a little bit delusional. Not a lot, but a little bit really does help. So two things that are funny because they're true. Number one, Ron has a laugh that is so infectious, it makes me feel way funnier than I actually am. And number two, there was a point in the interview where he was sharing so much wisdom with me that I actually became speechless, and he kind of took over the interview for me, (laughs) which is amazing. Okay, let's get into it. Ron, hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well today. It's been a good day. It's an early day, one of my parenting days, so oh. I've been up pretty early. You you have a son, right? I have two sons. Two sons. Yeah. Okay, how old are they? 20 years old and 15 months. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> You're in it again. You're like, I thought I was out. Nope, we're right back in it. 15 months. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Is he going through like a sleep regression right now? No, he's just a lot of um, teething, he's just little crankiness, <laughs> little general whininess, <laughs> yeah. but a very sweet boy. Well, I'm I'm so grateful you're here. I wanted to open up um, because one of the first clips I saw of you was when you were talking uh, from your special about the conspiracy theory thing, where mm-hmm. you were like, I understand you're not like a conspiracy theorist, but like, you don't even believe one, like not one of them. <laughs> And I'm wondering if you have any, like, favorite conspiracy theories that you like to dive into. I think the one easiest and topical one right now is just talking about aliens and stuff. The fact that you're like, of course there's aliens. Why wouldn't there be (laughs) aliens? And people will always call you crazy and tell you. And now we owe a lot of those people apologies, I feel like. And then it's still fun because you go and I went and did a show the other day and I said, like, oh, that person's clearly an alien. I was talking about the musician Bad Bunny (laughs) because he does everything and he looks like an alien to me. That's not a person. That's an alien. And then they were like... (laughs) They were just joking. And I was like, no, like, do you forget aliens are real? (laughs) Like, how will we get iPads and stuff? (laughs) So I know I asked him about what his favorite conspiracy theory is, but for some reason I was not prepared to hear a conspiracy theory. (laughs) Do you do you oftentimes like to add um, things that are kind of current and topical into your sets as you kind of are doing crowd work? Or is that kind of more of a rare thing? 
Um, I've been doing it more lately to make clips, basically. I've been trying, just thinking about business and my career with the strike going on and stuff. Yeah. And just took it as an opportunity to, like, refocus on what I enjoy in stand-up. What I loved was that I was like, oh, I'm acting. I'm doing different things so I can go and do stand-up. And if the room's half empty, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go back to work on Monday. Sure. And then it was like, well, now I don't have that. And so I should focus on trying to build my fan base, build these rooms out and like have well you know hopefully have full rooms and i was like the best way that is going right now is that people constantly putting out clips a lot of crowd work clips and things like that and i don't like doing crowd work i don't really care about other people while i'm on stage <laughs> um <laughs> that's, the, that's the most real take on crowd work i've ever heard because i know if i would i would just like stress out so badly if i had to do a bunch of crowd work because you just never know, right? You never know how someone's mm-hmm. going to respond in a moment or what a room's going to be like. Like, have you ever had crowd work go badly? Oh, of course. Okay. You get too mean or you hit on something that's going on or someone has a, a disease, a terminal illness oh that gosh. you don't know about. All right. Well, new fear unlocked. You know, it can completely turn your show around. <laughs> Do you remember one of your first bits or like kind of jokes that like landed really, really well where you were like, I am killing it? um i think just the first one where people started being like oh you're funny or you're a good joke writer was i just wrote a joke about the differences between chicago and oregon and just talked about how chicago you'd see all these like drug dealers or gang members and then Oregon you'd be like oh the blackberries are in season oh. and, and like I just remember other comedians who I had grown up liking or just became fans of as I got into comedy were like oh that's a great joke I just remember Reggie Watts when I first met him he was like oh man that blackberry joke he's like that's a seminal joke that's great and just to hear that from someone like him where I was like oh my god okay I'm, I gotta keep going did it take long when you first started your comedy career to feel like you were killing it um i think for a lot of people they have similar story where your first show goes like what better than your wildest dreams like i just remember being so nervous and and i think a lot of it is just romanticism where i just go back and maybe i probably got a couple chuckles but the fact that i didn't bomb and people were laughing and when i wanted them to laugh just gave me this high that i never felt before and i just remember to this day that i parked my car like just down the street and i'd walk around i just couldn't find it for like an hour just couldn't find it because i was so just geeked out of my head what is it like for you to craft a set has that evolved over time like from when you first started or you know has it stayed the same like making this like set for stand-up it's the same but quicker i find that i try to just kind of stay to my roots of what i enjoy in writing which is i talk about what i love talk about my family talk about um Whatever's going on in my life, I don't do much topical stuff. Um, I find the more that you do it and the more that you put stuff out and you do an hour and you, um, that's usually one of the biggest fears as a comedian is like you do an hour and you're wor- worried that you won't ever have enough material. Yeah. But I think you find that you have more experience and you know what you're doing. So you end up writing in a um, quicker fashion. Um, and just for me lately, it's just been all about just getting deeper into and more authentic. That's basically what my set is right now. It's just truly being authentic in my life, le- less of a people pleaser. Was that like an intentional shift that you made because you just got tired of kind of feeling like you were pleasing everybody around you? Well, I mean, it's just a shift in my life. I was um, married for a while, and at a point I didn't really, really enjoy it anymore, and it wasn't feeling authentic to me, and I felt like in some ways that was mirroring in my set. I started just feeling it creep into my work and creep into my life where I was feeling more like a product as opposed to my real self, mm-hmm. and I think sometimes that's a um, trap of gaining some success, you know, and getting a little bit of money and being like, okay, I want to continue to do whatever it is that you liked about me that allowed you to give me money. So when I was getting divorced and trying to be more my authentic self, it just now is kind of translating on stage, you know? Yeah. Okay, we have to take a quick break. When we're back, Ron tells us where he gets inspiration for his comedy. You want to know what's music to my ears? 
bread bowls. And that brings me to our beloved sponsor, Panera. Whenever I'm not sure what I'm going to do for dinner, but I know I want something nourishing that I'll really enjoy, I pick up Panera on the way home. Plus, with Panera's new crunch time feature, Panera will send you a reminder at whatever time you want to order your favorite preset dinner with one easy swipe. It's been an absolute game changer to make sure dinner is taken care of while I'm out running around. I'm going to start with my favorite, their mac and cheese, featuring a creamy rich blend of cheeses, but I also like to mix it up too, and Panera makes it easy. Sometimes I'll go with their Fuji apple salad with chicken. Or I'll try one of their unbeatably delicious and hearty soups, like their creamy tomato soup. It's a classic, and I have found no soup that pairs better with their warm, fresh bread bowl. And I have done plenty of research, trust me. So order Panera tonight to get a delicious dinner in one easy swipe. Available only in iOS mobile devices. Other restrictions apply. And for more information on clean, visit panerabread.com slash clean. I would love to take a second to tell you guys about Tara, the founder of Dreamland Baby. If you're a fan of this show, then you've heard me talk about Dreamland Baby before, but essentially it's a game changer for any parent with babies. So Tara was a new mom when she founded Dreamland Baby. Essentially, she was so fed up with how few solutions there were out there to help get her baby to sleep that she went out and designed her own, the doctor-approved, award-winning Dreamland Baby weighted sleep sack. She'd go on to be featured in Forbes for it and even make a deal on Shark Tank. So far, she's helped over 500,000 parents out, keeping their baby sleeping soundly and restoring a lot of sleep to them in the process. The sleep sack evenly distributes weight from your baby's top to bottom. Kind of like how weighted blankets help adults sleep, the sleep sack's cover calm technology helps babies unlock deeper sleep too. The sleep sack can be worn three ways, both arms in, one arm out, or both arms out. And it's made of 100% soft and natural cotton, super easy to throw in the wash, which is always important. Go to dreamlandbabyco.com and enter my code Elise at checkout to receive 20% off site-wide and free shipping. This offer is for new and existing customers. That's dreamlandbabyco.com and code Elise at checkout for 20% off. Do you have any like comedic voices that have spoken a lot into your comedic voice or the way that you tell jokes, like any inspirations that you pull from? I went to Amsterdam and Paris for a couple of weeks and like just watched a bunch of documentaries and went to some museums and got stoned a bunch and did mushrooms and love that for you. Um, watched, <laughs> thank you. It was a blast. <laughs> um, and I watched like George Carlin's documentary mm-hmm. and that was very helpful for me. Um, because he kind of went through a similar situation, not necessarily with a divorce, but just where he was finding success in one way and was like not feeling his authentic self and decided to like completely abandon that style of comedy to yeah. for something that was more authentic to him. So I would say that and I get a lot of my inspiration usually mostly from like music and um, pro wrestling. Pro wrestling. Mm-hmm. I love that. Do you is, is does pro Wait, what? Like, does pro wrestling, do you watch it and it inspires jokes? Is it you just enjoy the sport? Like, I've never had anyone answer that before, so I'm so curious. All of it. The answer to that is all of those things. Um, I enjoy the pageantry of it, the the creating characters and stuff of it. Um, I have written multiple. One of my, like, I wrote a joke about The Rock and how he was like the Beyonce for boys. And it was in my last, it was great. And it was my last special. And it was just a thing because I was trying to shop the special around and wasn't getting a lot of necessarily um, big interest that I wanted. And then it was super cool because I was like, you know, people kind of dismiss the wrestling thing sometimes, but they forget like a lot of people have a history with it. I think even if you don't like it today, a lot of people grew up with it. And a lot of the biggest stars today come from it. So when I made a joke about The Rock on my special being the Beyonce for boys, and then that's the clip they use, and then The Rock sees it, oh and he decides God. he wants to retweet it and talk about it, suddenly what a win. I got thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of, of promotion from one tweet about talking about something I loved. Yeah. I was not prepared to hear pro wrestling as a place that he finds inspiration for his comedy, but I love this so much. There's a thing in pro wrestling, which is called like just being a mark for yourself, which is if you get so caught up on your accomplishments, so caught up on winning all these championships, um, when 
in the grand scheme of things, it's someone else's decision. Like in wrestling, yeah. it's the booker's decision on whether or not you get a championship. A lot of times in comedy, it is a booker's decision or it's some network executive's decision. And I think sometimes people get caught up in that. And I always like to remember at the end of the day, with comedy, my wins are going to be like how much time I was able to spend at home with my family, how much freedom I had, how many trips I was able to take. Was I able to buy a home and take care of my kids because of jokes? So for those that don't know, a mark in professional like TV wrestling is somebody that buys into the emotion and the characteristics of the storyline and characters of the you know show that is happening in wrestling. And so this whole idea just was so profound to me that I went home and I couldn't stop thinking about it. I have not stopped thinking about it since me and Ron had this conversation. I, I love this moment so much. Yeah. That's honestly, that's something I've said more than anything in my new career as a comedian is I have, I've had a baby like, you know, newborn since this started. And so I always have said, I'm really grateful this kind of happened for me when I didn't have the time to do all the things that would be distracting from my actual job. And like networking is a part of the job and you get to enjoy all that and it's fun. But like, I'm very much in your, you know, train of thought of like, I just, I want to do enough to be able to be like successful in what I love doing, but so that I can be home with my family. Like I want to be able to provide for my family so that I can enjoy my time with them. It's like just refreshing to hear you say that because I think a lot of the times people can focus so much on being the best that they like stop being good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, they like sometimes being really good is like just good enough. Like you don't have to be the absolute best it's ever been. Yeah. And so it's just, it's really cool to hear you say that. Thank you. But that's so time consuming and mentally draining to worry about being the best. You know what I mean? Yeah. And especially with comedy. Oh my God. Like with stand up. Okay. That's like being the best chess player. Who knows who that is? <laughs> yeah. I yeah. It's so, it's so subjective. Yeah. It's not only subjective. It's like, I think sometimes just because like I love stand up. I mean, this is a lesson I learned long ago, but just because I love stand up comedy, it's just like how my friend, my best friend Gabe loves comic books. You know, he loves comic books. Can tell you about anybody, tell you runs, tell you who wrote this, who drew, who illustrated that. But like the average person doesn't care. They care about the Marvel movies. They yeah. care about Spider-Man. They care about that. And I remember one day I was like, when I was worried about being the best and stuff, and I was hitting every mic I could and stuff, and I was using it to like flirt with girls and I was happy that I was touring with people. And I was like, I uh, was trying to hit on this lady and she was like, I was like, oh, I'm in comedy. I'm doing pretty good. I open for great people. I open for John Mulaney sometimes. I open for Aziz and Sorry sometimes. And this is at the time where like both of these guys are like doing arenas and especially yeah. Aziz. This was like the Randy era of stuff. And so like he's like the like one of the biggest names in comedy. And so to me, that's like the biggest name drop I can yeah. do. Like, <laughs> oh, I, oh, I know Aziz and Sorry. And they just look at me and they're like, who's that and mm -hmm. i'm like oh you know the kind of, and they go like oh the funny little brown guy on parks and recreation and that like hurt my heart and like at the same time opened my mind so much to where i was like i remember that moment going like oh no matter how hard i work i could become the best and what i do i will be just like oh that funny black guy on that thing that they know really all it comes down to right is like trying to seek validation from other people where i i'm just kind of reaching a point a lot of it is the divorce and stuff where i'm like i know my value i was literally just talking about this last night i think the the further i dive deep into my career and the more my name is known in then in like niche ways, it's kind of like what you're saying where it's like either someone will know you very well or they have never heard of you. But there's like no in between when it comes to being a comedian, which is so funny. Mm -hmm. The the bigger our world has gotten in this, like the closer my inner circle has had to become because I just started to really need and seek validation, even from people like on my team or people that are close but aren't like family I've, I started to kind of like rely on validation from them that I was doing a really good job because I just needed that. And I found like the more I needed that, the more I was like let down from people around me because it's like I was asking the wrong people. And I, I literally forgot I had to be confident in what I was doing and know I was doing a good job. 
And I was just waiting for people because of the nature of how I got started online. It was kind of accidental. It just, it made, it forced me to rely so much on somebody telling me I was doing the right thing and doing a good job that I forgot I had to believe that about myself. Um, so it's, it's cool to hear you kind of explain that. Um, cause I'm going through that right now. At the end of the day, you know, as, Brutal as it sounds, sometimes you have to always remember, like they, besides you, like what you're talking about, your family, your close circle, like most of these people love you as far as much as much money as you make them. Yeah. And so you have to remember to put yourself first. I'm lucky. I'm super blessed. Like my manager and the people around me have always like supported whatever I want to do. It's never been like a push into like, you need to go do this because this is going to make us the most money. It's always been about about like what where do you want you, you I want like you talk about being here for the long haul I want to be doing comedy when I'm 70 80 years yeah. old so that means I can't get burnt out and be like I hate this industry yeah 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 <laughs> just me casually holding back tears that is so wise and like I just hope that I hope you understand how powerful it is for people that hear that because that is literally not n- common. Like that is not what people receive when they are getting advice about starting a career in entertainment in general. Like you hear you have to be at everything. You have to be available 24 seven. You have to grind. You have to take opportunities that don't pay well. And and I know that all you have to do all of that. And there is a lot of that in it, but like there does get to a point where you just have to enjoy this thing you've built. And It's not always about the next thing you do. Sometimes it's just enjoying where you're at. And I love that you get to teach your sons that. I love that, you know, you get to give that back to your family. No matter when it is in the timeline of your family that you learned it, you're getting to give that to them now. And it's just, it's a very powerful thing. Even for me, I'm sitting here and I'm like just taking mental notes. Like, oh my gosh, this is advice (laughs) I needed when I first started. Okay, time for another break. When we come back, we hear about Ron's vision boards. I do a lot of writing for this show, and I always try to be really careful about my spelling, my grammar, and just the overall quality of my writing, but it's hard when I'm moving so quickly to check everything. That's why every single day, I'm super thankful for Grammarly. They've helped me come off so much more confident in my writing, and also, I just feel more confident sending emails, like all of the emails. Grammarly does more than just fix grammar and typos. With Grammarly Premium, it takes your writing to the next level. To me, Grammarly is like having my own personal writing consultant right there with me, letting me know when I'm maybe being a little indirect or less concise than I could be. It's those little checks with their software that make all the difference for me, helping me strike the perfect tone and actually getting things done. The free version of Grammarly offers instant proofreading with comprehensive spelling, grammar, and punctuation suggestions. They also offer a tone detector, but I recommend the premium version, which offers clarity-focused sentence rewrites. You'll be amazed at what you can do with Grammarly. Go to Grammarly.com slash podcast to download for free today. That's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash podcast. Say goodbye to those old antacid brands and say hello to Wonderbelly Antacid. If you're like me and get heartburn from basically everything, you're going to love Wonderbelly. I know that for me, heartburn and indigestion can really affect how I'm feeling and even impact what I choose to eat, which is a huge bummer. I want hot sauce, you guys. I need hot sauce. Wonderbelly's chewable antacids instantly get rid of heartburn, acid indigestion, and a sour belly using the same active ingredients as many of the leading brands. Only Wonderbelly doesn't have talc, artificial dyes, artificial sweeteners, titanium dioxide, or GMOs. And they come in these super cute and colorful aluminum bottles. Wonderbelly antacids come in four delicious flavors, strawberry milkshake, lemon sorbet, watermelon mint, and fruity cereal. The strawberry milkshake one is my personal favorite. It's an antacid tablet that actually tastes like strawberries blended into vanilla ice cream topped with whipped cream. And it's dairy-free. And as if the flavors weren't enough, listen to Wonderbelly's tagline for this ad. Let's kick acid. Obsessed. You can get Wonderbelly antacid at Target or shop on Amazon with code 20 Elise M to get 20% off. That's 20 E L Y S E M, all one word for 20% off on Amazon.
I I heard that you do like vision boards too. Like from your special, you talked about it. Mm-hmm. it. Is some of this stuff like on your vision board? Like, do you have one that you're working on right now that you have in your house, or what does that look like? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I usually do a party every New Year's ish, um, where we have people come over and we work on our boards and we um, talk about our goals and have a great time. I love that. Um, and so. My board this year was just really about just returning to my roots and enjoying myself as a person and re- getting my own. S- basically, just like remembering why I got into comedy, remembering what I like and what I love and having fun. And so I just try to really enjoy it. I started taking jujitsu. That was on my vision board just because I like to do something where I'm like, oh, I don't want to do something that's like for me to gain a skill for money or to like be like oh now i can do this like i just want to gain another skill and i want to feel solid in myself and feel like i can defend my family and and so i've been taking jujitsu since the beginning of the year and that was a beautiful thing because it's sometimes you forget like you know i'm not old but i just turned 40 and i just was like uh sometimes i think that I found everything that I'm going to love, you know? So I'm like, oh, I love wrestling. I love video games. I love my sons. I know what I love. But then I tried jujitsu and I was like, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know I love jujitsu. Like, I love <laughs> jujitsu. I go three <laughs> times a week now. Wow. But like, that's wild. So it's just fun to find these new things that you enjoy. And I think that's part of the freedom of, uh, uh, being successful in any capacity is that you should be able to go and, enjoy these parts of your life that you wouldn't necessarily get to do if you were forced to still be at a you know a job eight 12 hours a day this makes me so happy to hear i think that the art of having a hobby just because is so amazing and i think it's really easy to lose that in adulthood so to hear ron talk about this makes me really happy oh my god i'm trying to just like let this sink into my bones i needed this so badly it's okay we recording it so <laughs> i know I think you- I'm just like, I'm like, you have no clue how badly I needed these things. You're just like, I'm just, yeah, wow. I, I, I'm like dumb. I like have no words. (laughs) Well, I got questions. I can ask questions. It's, I mean, you can ask questions for you. You can um, ask any question you want. (laughs) Tell me more about your career because I don't know much about your career. Um, and but I like the idea of someone because I started comedy what I consider to be the most traditional route, you know, which is I was in my early twenties, then I had my little son, but I didn't have much else going on for me, and I just open mic did and build it through things and went through road. And um, the idea of someone finding it through like online and and gaining popularity and then being like oh. Because that is interesting to me where I had to overcome a lot of rejection yeah. and then just build. But to start with like approval yeah. and then being like, how do I navigate wanting more approval, but also wanting to like say whatever I want to say? That seems difficult. It has been, yeah, it has been very, very interesting. I was a web developer and I started making content online, just storytelling. And I finally decided to be a content creator because it just made more sense financially for my family. And it allowed me to, you know, be home more, but it is exactly what you said. It was like starting with this immediate like favor and acceptance and then working backwards because then I I had to decide very, very quickly, is this like my baseline of just like millions of people like loving me? Like, how do you how do you like feel like a normal person after that kind of like immediate favor from people? Do you know what I mean? Like it it was like mm-hmm. really shocking and I had to very quickly decide what my what I wanted my job to look like, what opportunities I wanted to take, how to filter opportunities, um how to balance it all, how to not like get lost in it and feel way more important than I actually was. It was just so much and I finally feel like I have figured out how to like be very sober and like grounded in it with my family. Mm-hmm. So now we've kind of I've gotten into the driver's seat now and I'm not reacting to, you know, opportunities, but I'm seeking them out, I'm creating them. But it comes with this idea that like I always feel like I'm an imposter. And I'm wondering if you still feel that way, if that's the nature of the job or if if 
No. Yeah, you're like, I'm no, I'm born for this. <laughs> no. Not at all. Not one bit. Not one bit. Not one single bit do I feel like an imposter. Um <laughs> Perfect. It's just me then. <laughs> No. no, it's not just you. I understand. <laughs> I understand. It took work for me to get there, but it just was enough um, enough victories. Yeah. You know? Like I think uh, when other, one of my favorite rappers is Don Tripp. Uh, he's an underground rapper. People won't know. You don't need to know that name, but look him up if you want to. Um, and uh, he had this line that I really enjoy where he's just like, I... I I call I carve all my successes in stone and my failures in sand. And I was just like, that's such a um, profound way to look at things. And I do, I think there's a balance between like having an ego and being like, I did this and that. But like, what I like to use is, is it as a armor if people are, you know, mean or telling you when someone who, you know, never did comedy and doesn't, but they, they're just like you suck and like you get enough of that that you're like maybe i kind of suck yeah. but then i i have enough armor of being like well oh no i have this like placard that said i did conan i have this thing that said i did this i um i have i remember this moment when a comedian that i love said that i'm one of the best like it just becomes enough armor if i believe in myself then it it feels like i'm capable of more than totally. if i'm just like I've, well, I've literally felt my imposter syndrome and anxiety through that literally get in the way of me doing my job. Like I have been hired for things that I'm on a set trying to do the thing that other people know I could do because they're just like, they saw me do it and they're like, great, would you do that for us? You know, and then mm-hmm. I'm, I I will be in an opportunity and it's like, I, f- I have convinced myself and taken myself out of the running for this before I even started but it actually is so detrimental to my career for me not to believe that I can do this because then it makes me not actually able to do things that I am able to do. <laughs> and so yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's just um, a waste of time and detrimental to the process, especially what I do. I do a lot of acting and a lot of hosting and stuff. So if I were to sit there and being worried that I don't belong there, it's just taking up time, you know, the crew, we're here. I, I, we might as well do it. I can feel that way maybe later. And I don't mean to act like um, I just always had this. I used to feel like that for sure. I used to get on stage and to me, like every show was like a bank robbery where I was just like, let me see if I can get in and out of here before they realize I'm not funny. <laughs> wow. You know? and, and yeah, that's the perfect way to describe it. Yeah, like I tricked them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trick them again. No, yeah, <laughs> which keep tricking a lot of people. Oh my god, I can't even tell you. Last night, I was like, I asked, I looked at my husband, and I said, "Do you really think I am the person that you think I am, or do you think I'm just like tricking everyone?" Like, because I just got in this deep spiral of like, maybe I'm actually tricking me too. Like, do you know what I mean? You just question yourself for no reason. It just came out of nowhere. And, Maybe. And, and he was like, oh, I know you pretty well. Like, I think that you're just great. <laughs> it was, well, it was I, really I always, sweet, but it was funny. I just, yeah, I went into a spiral. I think it's okay to be delusional. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. I was, yeah, I've lived in places that have a, the high end spectrum for both. Like, I lived in Portland, Oregon, which was super high apathy. And lack of feeling like you could do anything, mm. and that, and you had to overcome that. And I always hated that feeling. Um, it just was self defeating all the time. And then I moved to Los Angeles, and you see the exact opposite. You see all these people who believe in themselves so much, sometimes to the point where it's very annoying. You're like, you you're should like, believe in yourself less. <laughs> a little less, yeah, right. You think that, but at the end of the day, like, what's what's better for them? Hmm. If you believe that and you're hitting it, like to me, that's where, I mean, I used to live, I was working at a bank call center, had a two-year-old son with autism. I didn't have, co- do comedy. And I was like, I believe I can headline shows. I believe I could end up <laughs> acting on yes. network television. That's delusional. Wow. But I outworked that delusion. Yeah. It's like a fake it till you make it manifestation kind of a thing. It's a little bit. I mean, it's not like I was like, I'm on a show. I don't think think I don't. It wasn't like I'm going to get, but I just, I don't know. I just believed in myself. I said, it was more of a, why not? 
I just need a tattoo on my body that says it's okay to be a delusional. <laughs> That's like my favorite thing. I need it on a shirt, all of it. <laughs> Is there anything that you do um, like daily or before a show if you do start to feel those things that like you aren't meant to be here or that you're, you know, robbing a bank again like is there any kind of practice you put into practice yeah. what what do you do um i mean overall the my main thing is that i just try to have my life and my stage life be as close as possible so mm. um and i'm lucky to be in a position um where i can work with mostly my friends and stuff so i travel with a lot of my friends cool. and it makes it easier and we're hanging out together listening to music i have them um the club or wherever i'm performing play a playlist of whatever music i'm currently enjoying so it's like i'm walking into my home basically just hearing the same music i love i come, hang out with my friends we bring video games with us and so it tries to have a little separation between stage and life as possible that's that I think really helps that and then just I also have a mantra um, that I tend to do and they've changed over time um, one of which was I think more imposter syndrome based because I used my first mantra I'll tell you um, was that um, I know that these abilities are not from me or within me but run through me please allow me to go out there and perform to the best of my abilities and to me that's a fine mantra for that time, but it really is taking away a lot of self-ownership of what I can do. Um, mm -hmm. And so my new mantra, which I partially I stole from my friend, my best friend Gabe, because <laughs> he was telling me what his mantra was. Um, it was just that he says that uh, his mantra was, I'm a vessel of light and I'm here to spread joy. And I was like, oh, I love that. So I'm going to steal that, but I'm going to add my little flair to it. So my current mantra, if I'm not feeling it, is just that I go, I'm a vessel of light. I'm here to spread joy. And I'm the motherfucking shit. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, my God. That is powerful. I love that so much. That is like the gr the greatest way to end this conversation is just that. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my gosh. Okay, Ron, this is it has been so good to meet you. I am just so grateful for like your wisdom and like I feel like you just encouraged me for like a straight hour. I feel you are an incredible human being. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I really, that's a beautiful compliment. I mean, I just, we were just talking. Just, just, <laughs> you're like, this is a normal day for me. I'm like, this is the best conversation of my life. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Ron. Make sure you check out his podcast, Getting Better with Ron Funches. And if you like this show, give us a rating and a review. It helps other people find us. All right. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Bye. There's more funny because it's true with Lemonada Premium. Get access to all of Lemonada's premium content, including My Five Questions with Chris Olson, which aired last Friday. Subscribe now in Apple Podcasts. Funny Cause It's True is a Lemonada Media and Powder Keg production. The show is produced by Claire Jones and Zoe Dennis. Our senior producer is Jamila Zara Williams, and our associate producer is Oha Lopez. Rachel Neal is our senior director of new content, and our VP of weekly production is Steve Nelson. Executive producers are Stephanie Whittles Wax, Jessica Cordova Kramer, Paul Feig, Laura Fisher, Kessla Childers, and me, Elise Myers. This show is mixed by Johnny Vince Evans, additional help from Noah Smith and Ivan Kraev. Our theme song music was written by me and scored by Xander Singh. Follow Funny Cause It's True wherever you get your podcasts or listen ad-free on Amazon Music with your Prime membership. Hey listeners, I'm here today to tell you about Lemonada Media's newest limited podcast series called Declined. This 10-part series takes you through the journey of two exceptional women from incarceration to freedom, ultimately leading to the creation of the Returning Artists Guild, an organization that uplifts the artwork of currently and formerly incarcerated artists across the country. Call Declined premieres November 27th wherever you get your podcasts. What's up, everyone? I'm Delaney Fisher, comedian and serial entrepreneur. And I'm Kelsey Cook, comedian and, I swear this is real, a world champion foosball player. <laughs> 
On our podcast, Self Helpless, we dig into everything from heartbreak to career burnout to the wild stories from our 20s and the many anxieties we've experienced along the way. We're often joined by guests who range from celebrities to renowned health experts. And together, we'll unpack big topics like deciding whether or not we want kids, building your dream career, strengthening self-trust, and much, much more. So join us every Monday for an unfiltered, entertaining, and honest conversation with friends where you don't even have to leave your house. If you're not wearing pants, we will never know. That's right. So listen to Self Helpless <laughs> wherever you get your podcasts. Yes. 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 Yes.